Um, I want to talk a little bit today about God has an answer. God has an answer. I want to read, you know, we're in, for those of you that are watching for the first time, we're in the book of Lamentations and um, we've been discussing this book. It has been a hard book, a hard book, because it almost would seem like there is no good news in Lamentations. And we talked about the downfalls and the challenges and all the other things that we face during these periods and times of life. So I'm so, so grateful um, for this book because it has really grown us in this series. So now we get to the final book. And I want to read it for you. Then I'll tell you what we're going to talk about today. Restore us to yourself. O Lord, remember, O Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. We have become orphans, fatherless, our mothers, are widows. We must pay for the water we drink. The wood we get must be bought. Our pursuers are at our necks. We are weary. We're given no rest. We've given... We have given the hand to Egypt and to Assyria to get bread enough. Our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear the iniquities. Slaves rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hands. We get our bread at the peril of our lives because of the sore in the wilderness. Our skin is hot as an oven with the burning heat of famine. Women are raped in Zion. We are women in the towns of Judah. The princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. Young men are compelled to grind at the mill and boys stagger on the loads of wood. Old men have left the city gate. Young men, their music, the joy of our hearts has seized. Our dancing has turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. For this, our heart has become sick. For these things, our eyes have grown dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. But O oh Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Why do you forget to forgive us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Restore us to yourself, O oh Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you utterly reject us and you remain exceedingly angry. Let us pray. Father God, we are ever so grateful that you have brought us this far. As we've studied through this book of Lamentations and we've talked about the consequences and we've talked about your grace and we've talked about your faithfulness. This morning, we ask for you to speak to the answers you have for us. In your name, amen. You know, one of the greatest challenges that I believe that we all face is that at this moment in this time in our life, we are faced with some significant challenges. And the problem when we face challenges is sometimes we can only see as far as our challenges. Jeremiah, this great prophet that had ministry for almost 50 to 60 years, is in Egypt. It's the end of his days, and he has been given the, um, the hard task to first call the nation of Israel to its iniquities and then to predict its downfall to the Babylonians. And now he's sitting in Egypt at the end of his days, and he's sitting there, and he is sad, and he is writing about all the issues problems and concerns. And what I've realized is that sometimes many of us have a Jeremiah moment, a Jeremiah spirit, because we are dealing with the realities of some hard situations. We are dealing with the outcome of things that are not going right. We are dealing with a world that is fully broken. But what I'm here today to tell you is God is still the answer. I know, I know. It seems antithetical. After reading 
this book. And after reading this text that we would still say God is the answer. You know, we first start in the book of First Lamentations and talks about the brokenness of the nation. And then we get to Second Lamentations and we talk about the brokenness of Jerusalem. And we get to Third Lamentations and although we have the top of the hill that great is thy faithfulness, that is more, profi- more prophetic than the reality of living in a difficult time. And we get to Fourth Lamentations and we hear about the struggle and the issue that the children of Israel experienced during the 180 days of siege. And then we get to this one, the final note in this book of Lamentations. And what would be sad is if this was the last part, is if this was the last issue, is if this was the end of the story. But when I reflect on lamentations across the arc of the entire Bible, I realize that what Jeremiah is asking for in verse 19 through 21 is actually happened because God is the answer. Now, we've spent a year in our country dealing with the virus of racism and hate, the virus of COVID. We've dealt with economic situations that have broken us. We have dealt with um, civic and governmental situation that puts us at tension. I rem- I was talking to somebody the other uh, to yesterday, and 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 we were both reflecting um, as we were both um, children of immigrants, and we we're both immigrants ourselves, and we both had come to America because that was supposed to be the greatest country in the world, and never did we think in the 80s when we when our parents made the sacrifice to come to the greatest country in the world, we would be dealing with a time where the government is so fragile and the health system is so fragile and our societal bonds are so fragile. But then I opened my Bible and I read this and I realized that even though it looks broken now, God is still the answer. I don't know who I'm talking to. I mean, as, as, I, as I read um, theologians, as I read about what is happening in the world, there is a lot of doom and gloom. But I'm here to tell you that the Bible still always answers God as the answer. Now, I want to give you three things that, this, that these last three verses let, lets us know. God is a God of redemption. God is a God of promise. And God is a God of innovation. Let me give you those three. God is a God of redemption. God is a God of promise. And then God is a God of innovation. So, Solomon, um, one of the, the, the tragic moments here is we see the destruction of Jerusalem. We see the children of Israel or a class of the children of Israel or part of the nation being taken to Babylon. And right here, and right now, it would seem like that is the end of the story. But what I know in my Bible is that 
even in our seasons of brokenness, God is still a God of redemption because the children of Israel didn't have to stay in the place and the position of brokenness that was Babylon because God promised that he would restore them and redeem them. Although they got there because of their own consequences, they got there because of the brokenness of generations before, they got there because they turned their face on God. God didn't say that I was going to destroy you for eternity. What God declared is that I will redeem you. So when you look at the book of Nehemiah, you will hear about the children of Israel, Nehemiah going back to Jerusalem and declaring, I will rebuild the wall, a wall that had been broken for 80 years. And because God was involved, it was rebuilt in 50 seven days. So there's two things that will that I want to talk to you right now in the redemptive factor. God has a plan and a timing for our redemption, brokenness, and issues in, in there. And when he does redeem us, it will happen quicker than we expect or we hope. So sometimes we want God to move right now, but God is saying there is a season where you will be in a dry place, but you won't stay there forever. And this is somebody needs to know this today. You feel like the dry season is going to last forever. You feel like the season of brokenness and the season of distance from God is going to last forever. You feel like God is not listening and God is not hearing, but God's very heart, his, his very build, his very desire is that no matter how much we mess up, no matter how much we think we're wrong, no matter how much our situation has broken down, God will always be a God of redemption. Now, I get very sad about the reality of where we live and, and I, I fight for justice and I will fight for every human being, but what I don't ever get is defeated and disappointed and depressed because I've watched God work enough. I've watched God through the history of humanity. I've watched God work in my life that I know that the very heart of God is to redeem a people. And right now, I need somebody to hold on to that because when God starts doing redemption in your life, he will snatch you out of a broken place. Each of us might not have broken lives, but we have broken places in our lives. It could be our psychology. It could be our spirituality. It could be our finances. It could be our family. It could be wherever you are broken in life and God will step in and be a God of Redeemer. Justin, I need to let you know this morning that it looks like the story might be finished and written. That is what Jeremiah was writing here. But what God will do is build a new kingdom at the end of the day so it will work its way out eventually. Sometimes it might not seem like you're going to be rebuilt. You're going to be restored. But in the end of it all, God is a God of redemption. Now, <sighs> the next thing God is, is God is a God of promise. Now, God from Abram, Isaac, and Jacob said he would send his son. God from David said he would speak the line of David, through the line of David, he was going to send his son. So, after you watch the destruction of the royalty in the princes of Jerusalem, you would assume that the promise of God would not happen. 
This is why Jeremiah is writing the epilogue right now. But we know, because, you know, we have the benefit of looking back. We have the benefit of seeing God's plan. And if God makes a promise, he is not a man that he shall shall lie. He said, I was going to send a redeemer. I was going to send the, I was going to send my son. I was going to give you a new covenant. And what God did, even though at this moment, Jeremiah is writing from the negative, is that he fulfilled his promise. Redemption breaks you out of your negative space, redeems you from the negative, but promise propels you. You know, most of us will look at God and get really happy just because God got us back to even. But I'm here to tell you that God is a promise keeper and he will Move us further. Let me, let me break it down. Let me break it down. When we look at the New Testament of the Bible, we see the birth of Jesus Christ and we see the, um, the resurrection after they tried to take him out of Jesus Christ. And what we're seeing here is God fulfilled promise on top of promise to say that he would send somebody that would be the propitiation for our sins so that he would stand in our way of heaven. He also gave us an opening to have direct conversation with God. He also said we would be transformed and we would be new creations. So no longer were we bound by the excesses of the law. No longer do we have to remember 619 things that we have to do every day to stay in place. What the promise does is it launches and it pushes and it works with us right now so that God can do more through us than we ever expected, hope, or acts. What are we? We are peculiar people shaped in designed by God to do peculiar things. We have now taken on the sonship of Christ. We are the children of God. And what I'm here to tell you is that the children of God are not defeated. They're not just back at base level. They're not just fighting for redemption. The promise of God elevates, it pushes us, it moves us to a higher level. And somebody needs to hear that. God didn't design you to have low self-esteem. God didn't design you to live in depression. God has given us the ability as the children of God to walk in the promise. That's why we need a generation of bold leaders. That's why we need a generation of bold believers because when God fulfills the promise in our life, it's not just about getting back to what we used to be. It's not just about getting back to where we started from. It's not just about being all right. What God's promise is He will give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. He will give us a new confidence. Our shoulders should be back. Our head should be up. We should be walking in the glory of God. I need us not to live a defeated perspective on life. Somebody might say to me, Pastor, that's the, you know, we live in a dark world. We live in a dark world. There's so much going on. There's so much pain so many issues. But what I find interesting in the Bible, in the Bible, Carl, in the Bible, is that it defines us, it defines us as the light of the world. So, and why are we the light of the world? Because when Jesus fulfilled his promise on Calvary, he made each of us, a, he gave us each a new creation. He gave us a new energy. We are being transformed. We are walking with the glory of God in our life. So even though we are living in the same broken world as the rest 
of everybody else. We are the children of God. We are the believers. We are the Christians. So our light will still shine because we are walking with the Holy Spirit. You know, the old saying says, when he walks with me and when he talks with me, Jesus, that's who we are. We are promised people. We are not broken. We are not depressed. We are not um, dealing in the same issues and challenges of the world because we are filled with the promises of God. He's a promise keeper. So not only are we filled with the promise of God, we know he fulfills his promises because we see Jesus coming to earth to respond at this moment. Now, the final point, the final point, God is a God of innovation. Now, um, you know, and God is a God of innovation. Pastor Smith, well, what do you mean by God is a God of innovation? In our most darkest times or in the times we feel most broken, the Bible shows us that God innovates in how he communicates and he works with us. Um, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can make this plain. Um, 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 from, the, from Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, he talked to the patriarchs and the tribes in that space, and that's how God spoke to us. But then Moses went into the wilderness and he gave the Ten Commandments and he gave the ark and he gave the temple. And that's how God spoke. Then the children of Israel asked for king and that's how God spoke. And right now we are looking at the destruction of the nation of Israel as they enter into Babylon. And you've got to understand that at that point in time, every religious thing that happened for the nation of Israel was based at the temple. But what happens in Babylon is a revolution of how the faith was passed because this was a place and time that synagogues were created because they still needed to study and be in relationship with God. And they didn't have the centrality of the temple right there for them to just go and just be. So they created the synagogue. And you will see that Jesus is called a rabbi, which is a teacher in the synagogue. So out of one piece of pain, God created the synagogue culture. You know, Jesus in his early ministry, you will hear him go into the temple and he will um, open the scroll and he will say, I'm here to speak for the brokenhearted because that was God innovating, and he had moved the word from one location, one central location, and started dispersing it out to the world. But, you know, if that was all God did to innovate, I want to give you the other place he innovated. When Jesus died on the cross, he died on the cross. Um, All the promises of God were wrapped up in just one nation and in one form. But what happens after Jesus dies is that um, the promise and the redemption of God is no longer limited to one nation. It is now allowed to go to every nation across the world, every man. You didn't have to be born a certain way. You didn't have to be, have a, um, you didn't have to have um, certain rituals like circumcision done to you to be accepted. God said, I will innovate so that each of my children can experience me all across the world. It was so radical that some people didn't believe it. But when I watch over the last 2,000 years, God has used this innovation called the church to spread his word. So check it out, Jermaine. He broke it from place, then he brought it to people. So, God is a God of innovation. Now, as I sit and I pastor 
in the year 2021. I realized in 2018 I, I, I was stuck in place and I was stuck on people. You see where this is going. But then COVID hit. And all of a sudden, we had to start live. Well, we did live stream before. We now nah, live stream a lot better now. We had to start live streaming, and we had to start zooming, and we had to start doing it. But what I have seen is the democratization of church. We have started to move from the building and the people in the pews to all out in the world. And as we stand here today, we are ready to launch our digital campus because God has said that his word and his people are no longer trapped to one building, trapped to one place. We are now a people that might be dispersed, but we're all into the community and we're all doing what we need to do. And what I'm here to tell you is that don't be scared of what God has for us next. Because even in the darkest times, even in the place of death, even in the place of challenges, God is doing something in the background that is transforming culture and he will come out on top. So right now, I don't want you to know that God has the answer. God has the answer. God has the answer. There's somebody today, somebody, that you've been looking for answers all your life. You've tried the best self-help books. <laughs> you've tried all the others way. But what God has for you is he has the answer. Even in the darkest places, God has the answer. <laughs>